Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Subcommittee on Disability Assistance and Memorial Affairs first virtual forum. Today we resume our oversight of the disability medical examination process at the Department of Veterans Affairs. This virtual forum serves as the first opportunity to examine veterans access to compensation and pension exams during the novel coronavirus pandemic. This forum is especially timely as states push to resume operations and as the VA works to resume its day-to-day -day integration of veterans into its non-clinical function. On April 2nd of this year, the Veterans Health Administration announced that it would stop in-person compensation and pensions exams at its, at its facility. Only a few hours after operations at VHA ended, my staff was informed by an exam contract vendor. The VA had instructed it to immediately stop all in-person operations on April 3rd. I commend VA for taking steps to ensure the practice of social distancing and to provide for the safety of our veterans. However, this abrupt pause to the CMP exam process has left some veterans to wonder when and how their claim will move forward. In the weeks that followed, the subcommittee received reports from VSO and congressional offices that some veterans claim denied due to a lack of evidence, evidence that would have been gathered had it not been canceled for the canceled CMP exam. Reports also indicated that some veterans were erroneously receiving notices for future CMP exams, even though CMP exams had stopped. While I understand the abrupt pause to CMP exams was necessary, communicating the pause to veterans was also necessary to avoid confusion. VA has advised committee staff to flag cases where veterans may have had their claim denied due to canceled examination, which we are doing. However, we should not allow a single veteran's claim to fall through the cracks during this pandemic. As of April 2nd, all CMP examinations that can be conducted through virtual exams, telehealth exam, or an acceptable clinical evidence exam had been shifted to VBA contract. As we discussed in a September 2019 hearing on the topic of contract exams, the VBA's contract vendors handle approximately 61% of all CMP exams. It's necessary to understand how this shift is affecting the ability of contract vendors to keep up with their CMP inventory, so we do not end up with a serious backlog that results in late delivery of benefits. Contract vendors have explained that in order to avoid a backlog, they must maintain an inventory of no more than 35,000 to 40,000 cases per month. With the ability to perform CMP exams in person, their internal analysis estimates that a single contract vendor would, around, would add around 30,000 cases to exam inventory every week. Each month without CMP exams would add about 100,000 cases to the exam inventory across all three contracts. And without any modification to the current exam structure and no resumption of in-person CMP exams, they estimate about 1.05 million exams sitting in contractor inventory by December 2020. Already, VA's public data is showing a rise in claims backlog. During the first quarter of this year, the number of claims pending longer than 125 days remained steady. But between April 11th and May 16th of this year, backlog claims increased from around 75,000 to over 100,000. This means that in the first month without in-person CMP exams, we've seen a huge spike in the backlog. This tells me that we must have a plan to keep veterans safe but also a plan to keep claims moving forward. Unfortunately, the VA is not here to discuss their plan for resuming in-person CMP exams with their contract vendors or to detail when and how VHA will resume its in-person operations. In order to feel confident that the VA has a plan that focuses on veterans and stakeholder needs, we need their collaboration. My goal is to ensure the safety of every veteran as we adapt to a new normal and make sure that now more than ever, veterans don't suffer through long wait time for their benefits. I'm holding today's forum to inform the members of the committee and the American people about what VSOs are hearing about veterans denied benefits, how we can leverage the role of the VHA personnel to reduce the CMP exam inventory, to better understand how the VA can maintain health and safety standards to minimize risk for our veteran population and also to hear about lessons learned that could be applied to quickly address a potential backlog of claims. I look forward to hearing from our panelists today and appreciate your ideas and input as we look for solutions. With that, I would like to recognize Ranking Member Boss for five minutes 
for his opening comments. Thank you, Chair Loria. And I would like to thank you for the scheduling this today, this forum today, an important and timely subject. How we will the dis disabled claim process, including necessary exams, get back on track in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. That said, I'm disappointed we are not discussing today's topic, through, or that we are discussing today's topic through virtual uh, forum rather than live in a subcommittee hearing. Congress is a, has a responsibility to provide oversight of the VA, and that includes conducting in-person hearings. This forum, although it's being publicly broadcast, is not and cannot be considered an equal substitute for the bipartisan and fair in-person hearings that this sub subcommittee has long had the privilege of conducting. As we all know, Congress is back in session today. There's no reason why the subcommittee is unable to conduct business as usual today in the form of a regular hearing with appropriate planning for logistics and safety per, uh, precautions. I want to thank the members of this subcommittee who have joined me today in the committee room as we do our jobs for, for, for the American people. This is the people's house and we are doing the people's business. We are taking precautions to make us safer, just like any American across the country has done as they've done gone to work. Congress shouldn't be any different. We should not hold ourselves to a lower standard. Nevertheless, I am still looking forward to the discussions that we are, uh, are here today with the stakeholders that are here to speak to us about this subject. Thank you for all for being here. While the VA is not present today, I'd like to take an opportunity to take this opportunity to thank Secretary Wilkie and Undersecretary Ben Fitz Lawrence from uh, ben, for ben, ben, for benefits, Lawrence, for opening line, open lines of communication they have maintained with me throughout this crisis. I was very pleased by the recent update that VA has developed a three-phase approach to safely resuming in-person disability exams. According to the VA, phase one could begin as soon as next month. During phase one, VA would begin conducting exams in areas serviced by particular VA medical facilities based on state and local guidelines. VA work first focused on exams for cases that require priority processing, such as homeless veterans, followed by veterans with the oldest cases. However, VA intends to be flexible and work with veterans who may wish to postpone their exam because the veteran is not yet comfortable attending this ex their exam. Next is the phase two. The VA would me make all disability exams available to veterans. However, at-risk veterans, such as those with pre-existing conditions, would not be eligible for phase one and two. Phase one and two would also exclude any exams that required the removal of personal protective equipment or PPE. Finally, VA would resume all in-person exams in phase three. I believe the VA has started to take the steps needed to begin the process of continuing in-person disability exams, but there's always more that we can do. Of course, patient safety is not is of the utmost importance, and while the VA is rightly focused on how best to resume in-person disability exams, I have questions about the VA's intent to catch up on the growing backlogs of exams. I appreciate the VA's effort to reduce the exam backlog through ACE and tele exams. However, as of May 20, VA reports that over 232,000 disability exams have been delayed as a result of COVID-19. VA's ability to timely address that inventory of disability exams is vital to avoiding another disability claim backlog. Therefore, I am particularly interested in the, in the participants' idea for how the VA can further tackle the current backlog of pending exams. Additionally, I would be remiss if I did not share that I'm troubled by the absence of both department and exam providers during today's uh, conversation about the disability exam. Chair Lurie, I, I do hope that, that, that I can get a commitment um, that we can make another day in public hearing with the VA available too, so that we can have, because to provide us with an update of its strategies towards disability exams and claims. 
remediate any gaps that arise from today's discussion. VA's insight is critical if we are going to de determine the best way forward on this issue. Quite frankly, I'm unsure what true information about the VA plan for disability exams will be able to, to gather today in a non-hearing without a VA present. Lastly, I am shocked that the full committee chairman Takano denied my request to allow members to use the committee hearing room to participate in today's forum. Chairman Takano's new requirement that the hearing room be used only for so-called official committee business involving house recording is a heavy handed departure from the preceding and the calls into question these virtual forums in the first place. As far as I'm aware, Republicans never disallowed use of any hearing room for staff meetings, forums, roundtables, or members response sponsored events. When requested by ranking member Walsh, Madal, and Feldner, when the committee was overseen by Republican chairman. This forum is a committee actively led by Chair Luria in which I am a participant in my role as ranking member of the subcommittee. Using the committee hearing room for its intended purposes should not only be permitted, but encouraged as long as proper measures such as physical distancing are observed. Moving forward, I hope Chairman Takano reconsiders his position on the availability of the hearing room for the committee purposes. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Boss. I would like to now recognize uh, Chairman Takano, uh, the Chairman of the Full Veterans Affairs Committee for five minutes. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Takano. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Luria. Thank you for holding this forum today on this important issue of medical disability exams. I have been tracking this issue for several weeks now, and I agree that VA needs to show leadership in the midst of this crisis by demonstrating preparedness. The numbers we're seeing at VA's, uh, in VA's data and from the exam contractors is alarming. But that doesn't mean we can rush back into normal operations without a sound plan in place. The health and safety of our veterans as they attend exams and navigate the benefits process is critically important. That's true more than ever during the coronavirus pandemic. And as we start to see numbers of incomplete exam requests and the claims backlog creep upwards, VA needs a well thought out course of action. VA told my staff that over 200,000 disability exams have been disrupted by the pandemic so far, but that VA hopes it can resume in-person exams soon. And I hope so too. But what I don't want to see is action without planning. A successful plan should incorporate the suggestions and advice of stakeholders and advocates. It should also reflect the advice of public health experts on social distancing and sanitation measures. It should describe how the Benefits Administration intends to work through its mounting backlog without sacrificing quality. The past has shown us that when benefits decisions are done quickly, uh, but incorrectly, they become appeals and VA's workload is amplified. There are many factors to consider as VA plans for the future. And I want to make sure that VA's hard earned progress in reducing benefit decision wait times isn't lost amid the crisis. I'm sorry VA isn't with us at the forum today to share with the subcommittee its plans on how to address this issue. As Ms. Luria and her subcommittee continue their oversight on this topic in the future, I hope we can count on VA as a partner. I'm confident if we link arms and work together, we'll achieve the best results. I look forward to hearing from our panelists, and I appreciate you all taking the time to be with us today. Chairwoman Loria, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Chairman Takano. Um, I would also like to recognize um, Dr. Rowe, 
uh, the ranking the ranking member of the full Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rowe, for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to recognize you for five minutes. Thank you very much, and I don't really have any prepared statement. I'm ready to go ahead and hear the uh, testimony. So thank you. I yield back. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Rowe. Um, if you would like to speak or ask questions later, uh, you know, please feel free to, to join in later in the hearing. Um, so with us today, uh, we also have four panelists here to speak about the CMP process. Uh, from the Wounded Warrior Project, we have Derek Fronenberger, Director of Government Affairs. Um, from the Veterans of Foreign Wars, we have Matthew Doyle, Associate Director of the National Legislative Service. Um, from the American Federation of Government Employees, uh, we have Richard Loeb, Senior Counsel for Policy in the Office of the National President. And finally, from the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, uh, we have Elizabeth Curta, Director of Education Workforce and Income Security Issues. Um, I would like to start with Mr. Fernenberger. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Loria, uh, Ranking Member Bowles, and members of the Subcommittee on Disability and Memorial Affairs. Thank you for inviting Wind Warrior Project to to participate in today's forum to discuss the Veteran Affairs' ability to perform compensation and pension exams during the COVID-19 pandemic. During this time of uncertainty, it is essential that we focus on issues affecting veterans and we applaud this committee for addressing this issue. Wounded Warrior Project's team of service officers helps wounded, ill, and injured service members and veterans apply for the benefits they have earned through their military service. And like my fellow panelists, we continue to assist veterans through the COVID-19 pandemic and identified some disability claim exam issues because of the current environment we find ourselves in. First, we would like to applaud VBA's efforts, such as increasing the total number of authorized telecMP exam disability benefit questionnaires from 16 to 29 during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. These actions demonstrated foresight and the ability to adapt to an ever-changing climate. While a monumental step for, forward in virtual CMP exam capabilities, there remain some limitations with virtual CMP exams, and we remain concerned by the ever-growing exam backlog due to postponement of in-person exams. We agree with VBA's decision to temporarily halt in-person exams due to safety concerns and move to a more tele-exam model, but there are still barriers that must be addressed to increase tele-exam capabilities. During conversations with VBA and third-party CMP examiners, we have come to understand that while VBA was able to increase the tele -CMP exam DBQ authorizing list from 16 to 29, there is only one exam that can be performed completely virtually. Those are supplemental claims for already established PTSD exams. Additionally, while VBA was proactive in increasing DBQs, VA as a whole requires an in-home telepractitioner to assist the, med the medical specialist performing the virtual exam for 28 of the authorized 29 CMP tele exams. This is obviously the largest barrier we have identified in transitioning from in person exams to a more virtual model. To overcome this challenge, we recommend a two fold solution. First, for VA to review all current 29 DBQs and find ways to waive some in home telepractitioner requirements. For example, it is our understanding that some CMP tele exam required an in-home telepractitioner for such things as blood pressure and temperature checks only. Therefore, we recommend VA waive these requirements to, to continue forward with virtual CMP exams when possible. Secondly, we recommend VA look for ways to work with third-party contractors and possibly BSOs to have mobile in-home practitioners who can assist with virtual exams when the in-home practitioner requirement are, is not waivable. This would be helpful for those who have limited mobility even after the COVID-19 pandemic is over. Wounded Warrior Project's independence program provides in-home assistance for some of our most critically wounded, ill, and injured veterans, many who have limited mobility. The proposed in-home practitioner model would help independence program warriors in attending CMP exams. Another concern is on exams for transitioning service members going through the MEB PEB process. It is our understanding that currently DOD is delaying medical separation because VHA has paused separation exams due to COVID-19 concerns. Once DOD and VA begin processing exams for service members going through the MEB process, we are interested to know what plans are in place to ensure the timely scheduling of CMP exams for these individuals. If possible, 
we would like to see priority given to transitioning service members who may now be waiting in hospitals or warrior transition battalions so that they may start their new journey once it is safe to do so. We also have a few additional recommendations for Congress and VA to consider. Currently, VSO service officers can request a 90-day extension to submit additional medical evidence due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We would like to see an automatic 90-day extension on all disability and compensation exams. This would allow VSO service officers and veterans additional time to submit outside medical information for exams once medical offices start to open. Lastly, we would like Congress and VBA to look at ways to expand tele CMP exams even after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is over. Often, one disability packet can require multiple exam visits, which in turn requires a veteran to take off several days from work. We believe that virtual CMP exams may resolve these challenges and will decrease barriers for veterans who are employed or have mobility and transportation challenges. We thank you for inviting Wounded Warrior Project here today, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have on this critical topic affecting our veterans. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us, and I would now like to recognize uh, Mr. Doyle for five minutes. Mr. Doyle, I think that you might be muted. Um, I apologize. We're having a little bit of trouble hearing Mr. Doyle. Um, so I think that we will uh, move on to the Loeb, and hopefully Mr. Doyle can join us uh, next. So, Mr. Love, you're recognized for that. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Gloria, Ranking Member Bost, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Richard Loeb. I'm Senior Policy Counsel for the American Federation of Government Employees on behalf of AFGE, which represents 260,000 frontline workers at the Department of Veterans Affairs providing health care benefits and other critical services. I appreciate the opportunity to offer AFGE's views to the subcommittee. The frontline VA employees we represent are dedicated to ensuring that veterans get the health care and benefits they have earned. This includes working with veterans throughout the entire process. One of the first critical steps in this process is the compensation and pension or CMP exam, where VA clinicians use their specialized knowledge and skills to evaluate claims for disability benefits. AFG has advocated over many years for the VA to recognize that specialization is required to conduct high quality CMP exams. We were pleased when the VA started building more formal CMP units at medical centers and began assigning more clinicians to conduct these exams. This aligns with our belief that medical specialization breeds excellence. This specialized workforce benefits veterans in several ways by utilizing and developing clinicians who know exactly what to look for during CMP exams, often leading to more thorough exams that are less likely to be sent back for a costly re-examination. Additionally, these clinicians who are integrated into the larger VA healthcare system are in the best position to notice the subtle symptoms in veterans that may be part of other medical conditions yet to be diagnosed. We've expressed to the committee in recent years our frustration in seeing one well-functioning CMP unit after another dismantled because of the increased use of private contractors. Not only did this policy shift re represent a waste of expertise and hurt the careers of CMP medical specialists, but was also not in the best interest of veterans, many of whom now have their exams conducted by for-profit entities detached from the VA's own integrated healthcare system. Now the VA is facing a potentially growing CMP backlog due to COVID. AFG offers three recommendations to mitigate this backlog. These recommendations, all of which are already within the VA's purview, require no statutory changes and allow the VA to better serve veterans' needs by reducing costly contracting out of CMP exams. The first recommendation is for the VA to improve its own internal coordination. In response to COVID, on April 2nd, VHA directed that CMP examinations immediately transition to being performed by EVA contractors to the fullest extent possible. The directive went on to say that VISNs and VHA leadership will maintain minimal CMP activities. However, six days later, on April 8th, the VBA Medical Disability Examination Office told its employees that VBA is taking the temporary measures to route all CMP exams to VBA vendors until further notice. Not utilizing VHA CMP professionals is wasteful and sending veterans out for non-integrated contract exams further drains VA's resources. Furthermore, this is another example of VHA and VBA failing to coordinate with one another. While VBA amended its guidance again on May 15th to say that, certain, that claims processes are to send any eligible examination request 
to VHA based on a so-called examination request routing assistance, or error tool. This error tool only keeps CMP exams within the VHA if VHA is reporting accurate capacity usage to VBA. We urge the committee to require VA to repair its internal communication coordination before increasing the use of contract exams. The second recommendation is for VHA to hire more CMP examiners. Following passages of the Mission Act, the VA has reported that it has at least 40,000 vacancies. The Veterans Affairs Committee has on many occasions asked the VA what additional powers or resources it needed to fill these vacancies, but the VA said that it had what it needed and the number of vacancies remained largely unchanged. Nevertheless, during a period that is coinciding with COVID, the VA has hired roughly 10,000 medical personnel demonstrating the ability to hire when they want to. While we have yet to see exactly which positions were filled, I am confident that few, if any, were CMP professionals. This begs the question, if the VA can hire so rapidly, why doesn't it hire more CMP professionals to fill some of the remaining 30,000 vacancies and bring this work back in-house? This brings me to AFG's third recommendation, which is the expanded use of telehealth for conducting CMP exams. VA has spent significant resources developing a telehealth program, and a pandemic presents the perfect time to maximize telehealth use. Pointedly, the Office of Disability and Medical Assessment released a fact sheet on March 25th itemizing 29 specific conditions that are eligible for CMP exams conducted by telemedicine. Additionally, we understand the VA has already taken steps to increase veterans' access to telehealth through wide dissemination of computer tablets. For both the safety of veterans and CMP providers, conducting these exams by telemedicine should be done whenever possible and clinically indicated. In summary, AFG believes that veterans will be far better served by a restoration of a strong internal CMP capacity at all VA medical centers. We strongly encourage the committee to continue to perform oversight on the VA's internal CMP capacity, both to address the impending backlog and prevent one from developing in the future. I thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this forum. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loeb, uh, for joining us. And I'd like to, to go back uh, to, to Mr. Doyle from the Veteran of Foreign Wars. I think that uh, I've heard that you've resolved your microphone um, and to recognize for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Loria, Ranking Member Bost, and members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the men and women of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States and its auxiliary, thank you for the opportunity to present our views on disability compensation and pension examinations during the COVID-19 pandemic. It is also nice to see the chairman and the ranking member of the full committee here as well. COVID-19 crisis has greatly impacted veterans. On March 13th, President Trump issued a proclamation declaring a national emergency concerning the COVID-19 disease outbreak. For three weeks thereafter, VBA insisted that it was open for business and that in-person VA and contractor CNP exams would proceed as scheduled. Finally, on April 3rd, VBA suspended all in-person CNP exams and migrated to a virtual telehealth appointment format. VBA's decision to continue CNP exams from mid-March until early April conflicted with the guidance of many local and state governments. In late March, most states ordered the closure of non-essential businesses. Numerous CMP contractors stopped conducting in-person exams to prevent exposing patients to unnecessarily risk. Many veterans proactively canceled their own exams to minimize exposure. In many cases, veterans were reported as no-shows, even where the contractors themselves canceled the exam. Our service officers in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, corrected an error in a veteran's claims decision related to this issue prior to the formal promulgation of the veteran's claim. The veteran was stationed at Camp Lejeune and filed a BDD claim with our representative in March. In early April, the veteran was contacted by QTC to inform him that all of his exams were going to be canceled due to COVID-19. However, during the 48 hour review period, our service officers noted that VA drafted a rating decision in which every single condition the veteran claimed was denied because, quote, we have been informed that you have canceled the VA examination scheduled in support of your claim, end quote. The VFW was thankfully able to intervene and have the exams reordered and held until a later date. VA says their formal guidance has been not to deny claims because of COVID-19. However, our service officers reviewed this decision late last month, just before the 48-hour review policy was eliminated. Since the elimination of 48-hour review, veterans will now receive these kinds of erroneous decisions and have to file more paperwork to fix this problem. Moreover, our advocates must use complex workarounds and tracking methods outside of VBMS in the hopes of finding all of our recent decisions in order to conduct a proper quality review. When the VSOs contacted Secretary Wilkie on April 3rd, we asked to have a discussion before any changes went into effect. The Secretary did not respond to our request until mid-May. 
We're now trying to play catch up while veterans are waiting for benefits. Next, numerous veterans have lost access to employer sponsored health care during the crisis due to layoffs. Veteran unemployment is currently near 12% and rising. For this reason, the VFW recommends that VA temporarily expedite or flash the adjudication of disability claims for veterans who are not yet eligible for VA health care and who have lost access to their private health care during the crisis. A disability rating is the gateway to VA health care for many veterans. Expediting claims for veterans who have lost their private health care during the crisis will provide much needed access to VA health care. Furthermore, during the ongoing crisis, many medical appointments are taking place via telehealth. Some veterans schedule private medical appointments to receive an, receive an objective opinion about their service-connected disabilities. These veterans could benefit from the use of DBQs. Until recently, DBQs were available to VA practitioners, CNP contractors, and private medical providers alike. However, last month, VA removed public-facing DBQs from its website. Accordingly, DBQs cannot be used by veterans who seek to obtain additional evidence from a private med medical provider to augment their claims. VA's removal of public-facing DBQs amidst the crisis was both imprudent and incomprehensible. DBQs should be used during in-person and telehealth private medical appointments to streamline and facilitate the collection of medical evidence and the diagnosis of conditions. The VFW therefore urges the passage of Congressman Barr's H.R. 6493, the Veterans Benefits Fairness and Transparency Act. We also encourage the addition of a provision to expressly permit the use of DBQs during telehealth appointments conducted by private medical providers. We have heard from our members that many veterans are willing to attend in-person VA and contractor CNP exams right now. However, a small number of veterans, especially those who are at greater risk of developing complications related to COVID-19, may not feel comfortable attending in-person exams until after the pandemic ends. Accordingly, VA should resume in-person CNP exams as soon as reasonably possible, and veterans must be given the opportunity to delay in-person exams at their own discretion without penalty. VA must also provide clear and consistent guidance to veterans and service officers regarding the resumption of in-person exams. This will help keep veterans informed and minimize confusion. Madam Chair, this concludes my testimony. Again, the VFW thanks you and the ranking member for the opportunity to testify on these important issues before this subcommittee. I'm prepared to take any questions you or the subcommittee members may have. Well, thank you, Mr. Doyle, for, for joining us. And now I would like to recognize uh, Ms. Curta uh, from the Government Accountability Office, the GAO for that. Chair Luria, Ranking Member Bost, and other members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to discuss the potential implications of COVID-19 on the Veterans Benefits Administration's ability to process disability claims. Last year, VBA used contractors to conduct about two thirds of the medical exams it uses to determine eligibility for disability compensation and pensions, while the Veterans Health Administration conducted about a third. Last month, both VBA and VHA suspended all in-person disability exams due to COVID-19. While some exams can be done virtually, the suspension of in-person exams will likely increase backlogs of medical exams and related claims that cannot be processed without an exam. This is happening at a time when the backlog is already starting to creep back up. In recent months, the number of claims pending, more than the 125-day target, increased from about 70,000 in early January of 2020 to just over 108,000 as of this week. Today, I will discuss lessons learned from how VBA worked through claims backlogs in the past and how the agency could position itself to address potential new backlogs. First, to look to the past. VA has been on GAO's high-risk list since 2003, in part because veterans were experiencing lengthy wait times for decisions on their disability claims. VA's backlog of disability claims continued to grow, and around 2013, VBA was aggressively pursuing initiatives to reduce the backlog. However, some of these initiatives had unintended consequences. Most significantly, they resulted in a new backlog of appealed cases that VA continues to grapple with today. Nonetheless, over the past decade, VBA has taken steps that have positioned the agency to be more nimble, such as moving from paper-based to electronic processing systems, and VBA has also expanded its capacity by using more contracted medical examiners and hiring more staff. These steps helped VA reduce the backlog of initial disability claims from a high of 611,000 in March of 2013 to about 64,000 in December of 2019. 
More recently, the backlog of appealed cases has started to come down as well. Turning to the future, under the pandemic, BBA is facing an unprecedented event that will likely add to its backlogs and result in taking longer to process claims. Our prior work offers insights into what VBA could be doing now to best position itself to manage any potential backlog. We have previously reported that careful planning is instrumental to ensure everyone is not only on the same page, but also on the right page. So first, careful planning requires a clear understanding of the problem. This could include knowing the number of exams on hold and the length of time pending, as well as data on the geographic location and types of exams needed. In 2018, we found issues with BBA's exam management system and recommended improvements that would allow for this type of in-depth analysis of delayed exams. However, BBA has not yet fully implemented our recommendation. Second, establishing goals and plans for successful resolution of the problem can provide focus as VBA works with the BHA, contractors, and claims processors to assess capacity to complete pending exams and claims. Examining how to achieve the goals can also help identify processes that need to change or resources that need to be redistributed. The development of detailed project plans is critical to ensuring all parties know who is to do what and when. Third, communicating with affected parties is critical. VBA will need to work closely with its staff and service partners to ensure that exam protocols and claims are handled consistently. For example, VBA needs to communicate to all parties any changes to exam safety protocols or claims processes. They also need to communicate priorities for scheduling exams and working claims once in-person exams are possible again. And of course, veterans will need to know what they are expected to do to obtain their exam and what, if any, options they have to defer an exam if they have safety concerns. Fourth, assessing and managing risks is key to avoiding or mitigating downstream and side effects of VA decisions. Downstream risk could include a spike in appeals workloads if the inability to participate in medical exams results in the greater denials of benefits. Strategies for focusing on the quality of claims decisions could help mitigate these potential effects. Finally, continuous monitoring, including a transparent means for communicating progress or pitfalls, will help BBA identify bottlenecks in the process and determine the extent to which its strategies are working. In summary, in these challenging and uncertain times, VA and veterans face many unknowns. However, BBA could develop robust plans to minimize the impact of delayed exams on veterans and on the overall claims process. This concludes my statement, and I will be happy to address the committee's questions. Well, thank you, and I thank all of our witnesses for joining us today, um, and we'll now move on to questions. I will uh, start with myself and um, would like to ask my first question to Ms. Curta. Um, in the past, GAO has reported um, on issues that the BBA has had in conducting proper oversight of contract examiners. Um, in your view, is the BBA currently positioned to provide proper oversight and process? And then how is that exacerbated or how will that challenge pan out uh, with the additional backlog that we're seeing now? Do you feel like they have uh, adequate resources or process in place to adequately oversee um, you know, what we've said is approximately two thirds of the exams now being conducted by contractors? Sure. Um, yes, as you mentioned, uh, GAO looked at the overs VBA's oversight of its contracted examiners back in 2018 and did find um, a number of problems with the oversight. And we made a number of recommendations to improve the oversight. Um, and the bottom line is um, they have made some improvements um, in response to our recommendations um, and the work that we did. For example, they um, they were having problems re uh, reviewing the quality of the contracted exams because they did not have enough staff and so they hired more staff. Um, they have um, made some fixes to their exam management system so that it's working a little better. Um, and they have begun auditing the training of its uh, contract examiners to ensure that they are meeting training requirements. However, they, none of our recommendations have been fully recommend, uh, implemented. And so we do have some concerns about their ability to, to fully oversee um, the contracted examiners, and especially under these circumstances where a large backlog of claims is building. Um, for example, um, they have not fully resolved the issues with their exam management system. They will need to have a fully functioning system to ensure that they can accurately track the completion of exams and also the payments to contractors. 
Um, and they also will have a lot of challenges doing the kinds of analyses that we suggested they would need to do to identify the problem of the, of the exam backlog and help monitor and address um, uh, the backlogs going forward. Um, also, VBA had responded that they plan to automate their system for tracking whether exam providers have taken required training, um, but they have not yet completed that automated system. And some of the other changes they had planned to make are on hold pending the completion of that automated system. So for now, they are doing um, these uh, sort of more manual um, audits of the samples of uh, providers, but not um, they don't have complete oversight over um, training that all of its providers are receiving. So implementing our recommendations will remain critical as VBA deals with the backlog of exam requests. Okay, thank you for providing and um, for highlighting the recommendations that are still not complete that would assist with that process of overseeing those exams. Um, I wanted to shift now to Mr. Loeb uh, from, from AFG. Um, I just, I wanted to hear, what are you hearing from uh, VHA CNP examiners? Um, have you heard that they currently have the capacity to do these exams? We've mentioned in several uh, testimonies um, you know, during this hearing that the attention was rightfully so shifted directly to, you know, everything, all hands on deck to support um, COVID, um, but in the current situation, um, it appears that they may have the capacity to shift back to doing these exams um, and seeing patients in person. Um, can you give us some insights from um, those um, examiners out there in the field? Thank you for your question, uh, Congresswoman Laurie. Um, what we are hearing uh, from medical professionals, uh, primarily physicians and psychologists, is that the VA is doing whatever they can essentially to curtail CMP exams, even when the capacity exists. Some of it seems rather petty. For instance, we have the story of one particular uh, facility where there are several physicians and psychologists who are able, willing and able to perform CMP exams, uh, but they have no administrative support staff any longer. This administrative support staff has retired or resigned and they are not allowed to gain access to the scheduling system. They're not allowed to perform any administrative duties whatsoever. So as a result, they can't perform CMP exams because they can't schedule the patients and there is no system for scheduling. The general strain of what we're hearing is that uh, there is a desire by VA management to essentially outsource the CMP exam function to private medical providers. And that we, the feedback that we get about that um, is that many of the private medical providers are doing it under uh, several circumstances that we're not very happy about. One is that many of them have little or no, no experience uh, with... I apologize to interrupt you, but you, I want to I pull up the time. Um, since each member will be allotted only five minutes, I'm going to have to move on and conclude my five minutes and recognize um, the, the next member. But um, if we do a second round of questions, I can come back to you to allow you to provide that right. additional information. Thank you. Uh, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time as we will have uh, votes potentially coming up uh, soon. And I wanted to give uh, Mr. Boss the opportunity to ask uh, five, five minutes uh, worth of questions for my Thank rating. You. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, my, my first question is uh, for Ms. Curta, uh, in your statement, you mentioned steps VBA has taken to address backlogs in the past and some of the bigger uh, syst systematic changes that VBA has made to do this. How do you view this potential backlog different than any other? Thank you, Mr. Boss. Yes, um, I think the main difference um, in this situation is are the circumstances. Um, I think in the past, um, a lot of the challenges and timeframes for um, problems were more well known. Um, right now, we are in the middle of a pandemic in which um, the timeframe for the resolution of the pandemic is unknown. Uh, the timeframe for when it will be um, safe for veterans to go back, for example, in phase one um, is, um, is unknown. Um, and so um, in terms of planning um, in, a, in a circumstance in which there are so many unknowns, it is more challenging. Um, but that said, um, I think it's even more critical when you have uncertainty um, to engage in strong planning. Um, 
you know, the um, some other pressures that are, are facing VBA that you just add to the mix is um, there is an influx of new claims under the Blue Water Navy um, legislation that was passed last year. Um, so at the same time that all of this is happening, they are also in, in getting an influx of new new claims under that authority. Um, and um, we think that further detailed planning could help VBA consider alternative solutions, assess the risk of unintended consequences, um, and use data to analyze the, the problem um, and, and, and you know, do some, for example, some modeling or some um, uh, scenario planning to address the unknowns. So, for example, they could create models um, for estimating the effects of this backlog um, and, you know, uh, plug in different assumptions about how long um, in-person exams are delayed and what impact does that impact that us have all through the system in terms of also um, addressing uh, the claims backlog. Um, and in the meantime, I think as some others have suggested, VA could um, pursue virtual strategies. Um, and um, I think the planning that um, VA could un undertake now would be helpful to sort of set them up for a more successful resolution once exams resume again. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dole, I, I would like to ask you at this point, uh, you know, your talking points, you provided a, the committee and recommendation the VA should allow contractors to conduct initial uh, mental health ex disability exams. Can you kind of elaborate on that and what your, your recommendation? Congressman Boss, thank you very much for your question. So at, at VA's policy right now is not to permit initial intake mental health examinations to be conducted by contractor uh, who, contractors who are conducting CMP examinations. And so uh, we at the VFW believe that um, it, this kind of is, is unnecessarily burdensome in, in the scheduling process. And instead, contractors should be able to perform um, initial intake appointments, and there shouldn't be any reason uh, to, to keep those appointments with VA only. And then my next question, because I'm, I'm going to run short on time, and I just and the chair, she's right, we need to make sure we keep these down. I know you said in your uh, opening statement, but I just want to get it on the record again, that that um, you support Representative Barr's bill, HR 6493, which would require the VA to publish the public facing DBQs on its website. Congressman Boss, yes, thank you. We, we absolutely support Representative Barr's bill. And uh, we, we urge its passage as well with the um, change that we suggested to expressly permit uh, DBQs to be used during telehealth appointments with private medical practitioners. Right. I thank you for that. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Boss. Um, I would now like to recognize uh, Mr. Takano, uh, the chairman of the full Veterans Affairs Committee uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Luria. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Loeb. Uh, Mr. Loeb, in your opening statement, you said AFGE takes position that veterans greatly uh, benefit greatly from having their compensation and pension exams conducted by VHA health by a VHA health professional. Can you elaborate on those benefits? And um, are the VHA professionals currently conducting? CMPs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the question. Uh, we believe that the specialized nature of veterans health care, the experience that veterans have while serving and the types of clinical uh, issues they present uh, are best handled by people who have experience with uh, providing health care to veterans. Uh, we find that's particularly the case with respect to mental health care, but across the board with various types of symptoms that uh, veterans frequently present. And that the experience that VHA uh, clinicians learn over the course of the years of their, uh, their practice make them really experts in their field. And we think that that is something that is really incalculable benefit to the veteran. So we, we feel very strongly that that nature, specialized nature of the healthcare, uh, uh, providing the healthcare by people who are experienced dealing with veterans is extraordinarily important. 
um, you, I think the second part of your question was whether um, we are finding that the exams actually can be conducted by in-house VHA CNP uh, clinicians. And the answer, unfortunately, is increasingly no. Uh, the increasingly, that is not the case. And in uh, to, to, to final sort of follow up on the answer uh, to the question posed by Congresswoman Gloria, uh, we tend to find that the uh, contracted examiners are far more uh, inexperienced. Uh, they have little or no veterans experience, particularly in mental health area, which of course is so uh, critical to veterans. And we also find that there is tremendous pressure to hold costs down. Uh, many of these uh, contract providers are, are under tremendous financial pressure. In fact, we just learned earlier today that at least one contractor is providing for its, uh, its telemedicine uh, providers $50 less per exam, uh, exam because it's being done by telehealth, which doesn't exactly encourage that type of practice or that type of approach, which is rather uh, ironic given the fact that we're in a, a pandemic. Mr. Chairman, I think we've lost your audio or I've lost my audio. <laughs> Mr. Loeb, uh, I, I, I turned it off and then I forgot to turn it back on again. Mr. Loeb, <laughs> tell me whether or not um, uh, you, uh, the contractors are paid on a per exam basis and uh, when they do lower uh, the compensation to their contractors, um, I mean, I'm assuming that these it's it's very few solo uh, comp and uh, comp and pen examiners that they work for uh, a contractor, and that contractor um, sets how much they're going to be paid. Um, is that correct, uh, Mr. Chairman? It's my understanding they're paid on either a uh, sort of a piecework approach for each exam. Uh, with strict time limits on each exam. So I think the answer to your question is yes. And my understanding, at least with respect to this one contractor, uh, which I'm told is a very a large healthcare uh, corporation, they do pay less for telemedicine uh, services. And so, I'm not so, part of that. So it's ba the, the contractor basically sets the pay rates. It's not the VA that does that when, it's the, when they farm out the work to a contractor. Well, having many years of experience in, in, in government contracting issues, uh, I believe that, yes, it's fair to say that the contractor establishes the rates of pay. Uh, how involved the VA may be in reviewing those rates of pay, I, I, I cannot say. But certainly the, the contractor and the uh, provider of the actual service come to some agreement on pay. Um, I see that. I, do you know if there's review about the quality of these contractor comp and pen exams? Um, by the VA? I can't answer that question directly, uh, Mr. Chairman. I can tell you that our experience at AFG that we hear from our members who do provide the exams is that uh, more of them are resubmitted for a re-examination when they come from contract providers than when they're done by in-house staff. Thank you. I, I yield back. I'm sorry we're going over my time, Cheryl. Thank you for joining us, uh, Chairman Takano. And um, I would now like to recognize uh, Mr. Villarakis for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for holding this uh, forum, I guess they might call it. And I appreciate it so much. Uh, this The first question is uh, for all the VSOs. Uh, do you have any suggestions or best practices to follow for how VA can truly leverage telehealth and the acceptable clinical evidence process to complete exams that would otherwise be delayed because in-person exams uh, are unavailable. Do you expect this to help alleviate any potential backlogs that may arise when things get uh, back up and running? Uh, so I don't know who would like to go first on that, but I'd like to hear from the VSOs, please. Congress, uh, Congressman, this is Derek from Wonder War Project. I appreciate the question. Um, I think that's a, a great topic that you bring up. We highlighted that a little bit in our, our testimony. What we're seeing is that the vast majority of the 29 DBQs that are eligible for virtual CMP exams uh, are in need of an in-home in practitioner to help the specialist that's actually doing it. 
to the theory is somebody would still have to be with the veteran to do the blood work or I'm sorry, the blood pressure check and the temperature check, and then the specialist would be able to ask the questions. So from our understanding, that seems to be the biggest barrier. So what we're asking is for VA to review those uh, 29 DBQs and see if they can waive some of those requirements so that we can get these through the system. Um, if we have a veteran that has 10 contentions on a uh, uh, packet uh, and they can get eight of them done now, that means they only have to do two once we start opening back up. That would be all that. Right. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Uh, yes, Congressman Bilarakis, this is Matthew Doyle from the BFW. So thank you for your question. Uh, to echo what my colleague just mentioned, I think um, reevaluating VHA's list of, of 29 possible uh, telehealth appointments uh, is, is absolutely a good first start. And perhaps VBA should even reevaluate its policy of requiring um, the taking of vitals for all appointments conducted via telehealth. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that that, that that step is necessary. And so perhaps if there's a way to waive that requirement, uh, it could expand the number of, of uh, telehealth appointments that can be conducted uh, via um, for, for compensation exams. Thank you. Next question is for Mr. Fernandberger. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, do most veterans, especially those who are severely wounded, have the equipment they need to be able to participate in virtual disability exams? Or is this a significant hurdle for many of our heroes? That's a great question, Congressman. Um, I think for in-home virtual CMP exams, a lot of veterans will not have the, you know, the, the, the equipment to do a blood pressure check on themselves. Uh, for those that do have uh, in-home nurses, um, you know, those that are in our, our independence program or others that um, have uh, care in their home, those individuals can be trained uh, through VA to actually perform that function for a CMP exam. And a lot of them do have that, uh, that equipment already. Very good. Thank you. And uh, for Mr. Doyle, uh, we're told that the VA is reviewing all claims that were denied during the pandemic because they've uh, incorrectly, the VA incorrectly reported the veteran is a no-show for a disability exam. Uh, do you have any suggestions for potential additional ways VA can ensure that veterans are not penalized for missing an exam due to the COVID-19, especially since it may uh, have been through, you know, no fault of their own uh, and they need to be seen. So any ideas, any suggestions, please? Uh, again, the question is for Mr. Mr. Doyle. Thank you for your question, Congressman. So as you mentioned, um, it, there, there is this claim that, that VA is reviewing uh, decisions that were denied uh, during the COVID crisis for uh, missed C&P examinations, but we're still hearing that these veterans are still required to file uh, for supplemental claims or, or higher level review. And so um, that's, that's what we're seeing on our end. But in terms of ensuring that veterans aren't having their claims denied for missing their C&P examinations, I think we need to provide veterans with more choice in how their exams are scheduled um, and provide them with the option of canceling exams due to health concerns uh, with no penalty to the individual veterans. Themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. I, well, I know my time is, uh, I only have 14 seconds, so uh, I want to thank the chairwoman for holding this hearing. Very important hearing. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Excuse me, I think I was muted there for a second. I, I said thank you uh, again, Mr. Bilarakis, uh, for joining us. Um, and I think we'll have a chance to do a second round if you have more questions in a few minutes. And I would now like to recognize uh, Representative Underwood for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us today. I'm glad the subcommittee is holding today's round table uh, to focus on the efforts of this pandemic on VA's compensation and examination system. To Ms. Curta, at GAO, you've examined several federal disability programs, including the VAs. I'm concerned that missteps when it comes to providing disability examinations during this pandemic could significantly increase VA's case backlog. From your experience, how would an increase in a backlog of this size affect VA's ability to serve veterans? Is 
Ms. Curtis still with us? I'm sorry, just okay. just unmuting my, uh, myself. Oh, yes, yes well, I think I think the the major impact is just the passage of time. Um, these veterans um, already the the process takes many days to complete, even under the best of circumstances. And some of these veterans, um, particularly ones that have appealed their claims, are have been waiting even longer. Um, and so delays in exams means that um, veterans who, um, and, and often uh, veterans are uh, uh, very strong financially and, and need the funding to, um, to um, you know, maintain their standard of living. So um, the delay uh, in exams is going to um, really uh, just sort of keep money out of the pocket of the veteran um, for longer than it would, which should ordinarily take and could really exacerbate that going ahead. Um, and so based on your experience, what would the VA be doing now? What should the VA be doing now uh, to prevent that backlog from growing significantly during the pandemic? Well, I think they have to just engage in really intensive planning. Um, as I said in my, my opening statement, um, you know, there's sort of, uh, sort of five key steps to that. They need to um, really analyze this problem um, and have get as much data as they can gather um, to know sort of the nature and the scope of the exam backlog problem. Um, they need to um, establish some goals for what they plan to do about the problem. What what do they see as success in terms of bringing it down? Under what kind of timeframes? What what is their desired end state for this? Um, they need to uh, work with their stakeholders. I think um, everyone at the table today. Um, and VA staff um, and the contractors. Um, VA has to share information broadly um, with all of these partners to ensure that whatever solutions it comes up with um, are actually fixing the problem and not creating new problems. Um, and that information is shared consistently across all the parties so that everyone hears the same information. Thank you. Mr. Friedman, we've heard from some VA, VHA employees who are full-time examiners that they've lost their jobs. Um, as a result of the thousands of canceled or postponed compensation and pension examinations. Do we know how many um, examiners have lost their jobs as a result in this pause? And it's okay if it's an approximation. I'm sorry, was, the, was this question intended for, for me? Mr. Friedman? Is there not a Mr. Friedman? Okay. Uh, then whoever can best answer. Um, we've heard that some of the VHA employees uh, who are the full-time examiners have lost their jobs. Do you, does anybody know how many that might be? Uh, Congresswoman, uh, this is Richard Loeb from the American Federation of Government Employees. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you for the question. Um, I, we, I have not heard of any uh, people being laid off so far at the VA. Uh, but I will be happy to check uh, check into that and get back to you. Okay, and then if there is a decrease in the number of examiners, how would that uh, impact the wait times for future examinations? Uh, well, I think as we're already seeing that as the number of exams are being shifted to contractor providers, that the wait times are in fact getting quite a bit longer. And one of the things that AFG believes is very important is that the VA used its authority and its acknowledged vacancies, which I think at last count were about 30,000 to, to fill all those positions so that they can conduct CMP exams more effectively, efficiently, and timely. Okay. Thank you all very much for your time today and for the work that you've done for the veterans community. I yield back. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Underwood, uh, for your questions. And I would now like to recognize uh, Representative Watkins for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for Mr. Loeb. Mr. Loeb, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, according to a 2017 GAO report, over half of VBA's claim processors had telework agreements in place to work three or more days a pay period from home. In light of COVID-19 VBA in light of COVID-19, VBA moved to allow all claim processors to telework. What issues, if any, have you heard of from claim processors regarding their ability to get work done in a remote environment? Thank you for the question, Congressman. We, I have not heard of any specific problems with uh, providing these um, 
these uh, doing the claims processing and examining and reviewing the veterans' claims, um, either as a result of uh, prior telework agreements or of current telework agreements. So I, I think that it's fair to say that we think that the system works reasonably well. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, so there's uh, nothing more that needs to be done to assure efficiency, effectiveness, and accountability. Uh, well, of course, we always like to see, you know, better IT systems when, especially when people are teleworking, uh, we have, we represent people at other agencies who have had some access problems with IT, uh, particularly as it relates to security concerns. And certainly we would hope that the VA could provide uh, necessary security so that people's medical records are protected and not uh, you know, released inadvertently. Uh, but, but short of that, we have not had any difficulties with allowing employees to telework or particularly in this case of, of, of non-clinical uh, types of work, that is, you know, examination, benefits claim examining. Uh, we, we certainly support telework and think it should be used to the extent that that's practical. That's great to hear. Thank you, Mr. Loeb. Uh, thank you, thank you. Ranking, ranking member um, Boss and Madam Chair. That's all. I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Watkins, for joining us today. And I will now recognize Mr. Albright for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and, and thanks to our, our witnesses for joining us. Um, Mr. Doyle, I wanted to ask about uh, the 48 hour review policy and ask you to elaborate on your opening comments about how this is a particularly bad time uh, for this policy to be removed uh, for us to advocate uh, for veterans and, and how that's playing out uh, in the real world. Congressman Allred, thank you for your question. So the 48 hour review policy was an absolutely essential feature of the uh, disability claims process. It allowed uh, accredited service officers to catch errors uh, before official claims were, were promulgated and veterans were notified. Um, VA very, VBA very abruptly um, rescinded this policy because it wasn't grounded in regulation or statute. Um, and, and in so doing, uh, ver vet veterans have been burdened unnecessarily and have been forced into the appeals infrastructure after official claims are promulgated um, and errors can't be caught earlier on. And so um, it, it delays, uh, rescinding the policy has delayed the delivery of benefits to veterans. And uh, we're also concerned that um, it will cause the appeals infrastructure uh, to be overburdened and, and many of the um, changes implemented during the Appeals Modernization Act will be undone. Yeah. Particularly when we're seeing such a large backlog uh, build up, it seems like a, a particularly bad timing uh, for a decision like this. And you know, I thank you for using y'all's voice uh, on this. and. And our committee has obviously I've been taking a very close look at this and we'll continue to work with you and just want you to know that we are aware of, of the complications that this is creating uh, and, and you know, really want to thank you for raising it. Um, Mr. Loeb, you, you mentioned you'd like to see us expand telehealth and I just wonder if you could um, briefly tell us what you think the biggest obstacles remain for additional expansion right now. Well, I think some of the, th thank you for the question. Congressman Allred, uh, we think some of the, the issues that relate to um, telehealth are, uh, are obviously making sure that the, uh, the veterans have access to tablets. And I must say that I think the VA has done a pretty good job at making sure that more tablets are available. There are also always issues with access to uh, high-speed internet and with uh, IT issues in general. Uh, some veterans don't have access to that type of technology, and and that uh, continues to be something of an issue. For it. I, I wanted to uh, also point out that, uh, and this doesn't necessarily directly address the the telehealth issue, but we are finding that at least with respect to benefits uh, claim processing, that people who are doing this uh, while teleworking are having higher rates of productivity. Um, so. I think some of the other uh, speakers from the veterans organizations have pointed out that there are some aspects of telemedicine, which such as taking vitals, which are very are, are not really possible to do. And I think that it's up to the, uh, the clinicians who are actually practicing in this area to use their best uh, professional judgment. Um, we do think, obviously, that in, in many cases, 
that the use of telehealth, particularly for mental health and, uh, counseling, is, is 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 vital. Not only uh, at this time, but 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 much of the time. Although obviously it's still not a substitute for one-on-one you know, in-person meeting with with uh, various professionals, uh, mental health professionals. Well, thank you all so much uh, for your testimony and for helping us uh, consider what we need to be doing during this time. You know, in Texas, we're probably going to add from uh, some of the expectations a million uh, people to our uninsured roles. That will include many of our veterans. Uh, so we recognize how important it is that they be able to get uh, these examinations uh, and get their disability claims processed. So thank you so much for, for helping us work on this. And uh, Madam Chair, yield back. Well, thank you, Mr. Allred, for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to offer a second round of questions uh, to any of the members who would like to ask further questions. And I will just uh, lead off um, by recognizing myself for five minutes um, and specifically wanted to hear more from the VSOs. Um, so I know Mr. Fronenbarger from uh, Wounded Warrior Project and Mr. Doyle from BSW um, get a lot of good feedback from the veterans in our community. But how much feedback or how much interaction do you get from the VA to the VSOs, kind of you know, asking what we're hearing from veterans on the ground. And really, have you had any communication or with the with the VA directly um, about how veterans feel about resuming in-person CMP exams and what those things are that would make them feel more comfortable? I know that's been touched on, but have you had those conversations with the VA um, from the VSO perspective? And I'll start with Mr. Fernabarger. Chairwoman, thank you for that question. I think that's a, actually a critical question here as we look at potentially opening up in-person exams and you know, how that looks at the national level. Um, we have actually spoken with a lot of our veterans. Uh, I think it crosses all spectrums. Some are uh, willing and able and open to the idea and others uh, are no on, on that fact, uh, just depending on where they live. Uh, speaking with VA, um, we've had some very productive conversations, but we haven't really been able to broach that subject on when uh, we're going to look at opening up in-person exams. I think personally, that's a very critical um, aspect that we need to touch on as it allows us to communicate to the veteran population when that might be. And if they do have issues, what their options are. And right now, we're not sure what the options are. Um, so I, I do think that the, there are definitely a lot of questions. I, I obviously acknowledge that VA is trying to figure this out, uh, much like the rest of us, as it's going. Um, but I, I would say uh, you know, the sooner we can figure that out, the better. Well, thank you. And uh, Mr. Doyle uh, from VFW, do you have any feedback? And can you also share uh, what your communications uh, with the VA and, um, and what you've shared as far as what you've learned from veterans? So thank you for your question, Madam Chair. So as, as the ranking member uh, mentioned during his opening remarks, uh, VBA has has put forth some, um, I guess, a three-point plan to re reopening um, uh, facilities, but but we haven't heard any communication from VBA uh, regarding this specific issue. And so I would encourage VA to engage in a more open dialogue with VSOs to, so that we can keep our members and, and the veteran community at large informed about uh, what to expect in the future. Um, but but short answer, no, we haven't heard much feedback from VBA regarding, uh, regarding this specific issue. Well, thank you. And I thank both of you for, for being here. Um, I know that you do a lot of work as the VSOs interfacing directly with the veterans in our community. And you're two great organizations of many VSOs out there who work so hard for our veterans. But I think, so I thank you for being here today to, to speak on behalf of the veterans um, on this important topic. And um, I uh, will yield the rest of my time uh, and recognize Mr. Boss if you have any follow on questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Curta, when we know from GAO's body of work that the appeals workload continues to be a concern. So how do you think the exam backlog might affect appeals? What can and what can BBA do to mitigate any risk in this area? Thank you, Mr. Bost. Um, I think as it's been discussed by a number of folks today, the main concern is that as you are addressing um, a growing backlog of initial claims, um, uh, if there is an effort to, you know, just the volume in of, of itself means that there will be more appeals um, because some of those uh, uh, decisions will be denials and uh, some veterans will 
appeal those denials. So you've got sort of a growing workload. Um, there could be skewed incentives if the um, focus is on resolving all the problems quickly um, to the detriment of quality um, so that decisions um, are perhaps denied when they should have been uh, granted. Um, and that can lead to appeals. Um, we expect, um, although the appeals workload has its uh, dedicated resources, um, some of those appeals um, under the new um, Appeals Modernization Act do involve new evidence and may be dependent on medical exams as well. Um, and so um, delays in those exams could you know, further exacerbate the appeals backlog. Um, and um, so it, it is important to, um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, set goals and work with partners to adopt consistent solutions across organization lines. Um, in this case, VBA and the board may both need data on delayed exams to determine the impact on their appeals backlog. Thank you. And uh, I wanna say thank you to the chairwoman for putting this together and for all of you being here. We appreciate the input on this very, very, very important subject as we move forward in this pandemic and make sure that every claim is handled as quickly as possible, even in these hard times. So with that, I yield back. Well, thank you, Mr. Boss, and thank you as well to all of the other members who were able to join this conversation today and to our witnesses. Um, I think it's clear from this discussion that we need to continue to monitor the VA's plan to open the CMP exams, and especially how they will address uh, what is a growing uh, backlog. I think it's time right now to plan carefully the next steps to ensure veterans health and safety um, and a smooth process for identifying um, claims uh, for those who need uh, the health care and those especially who need it in this, this time of the COVID crisis as some of our witnesses mentioned. Uh, with the rising amount of unemployment, um, these benefits um, and access to health care through the VA is especially important to our veterans. Um, I hope in the future, um, in these conversations, that the VA will join us for these conversations. Um, and, um, you know, with veterans' lives at stake, I think that the VA needs to clearly communicate instructions for reopening exams, both to examiners and to veterans. Um, and our VSOs are great conduits in getting that information to the veterans. And I think that we heard from a, a couple of VSOs today, uh, both the, the Veterans of Foreign Wars and the Employer Project. Thank you joining us heard from both organizations um, that they would value clearer communication on the process moving forward um, so that they can share that in turn with our veterans um, and give them confidence in the process and um, that any delays be addressed um, as we um, move forward with the COVID crisis and uncertain times. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for participating in this virtual forum. Um, I also want to thank our, our committee staff um, for putting together the tools that made this possible. Um, in a way that we can allow our witnesses to participate from afar. Um, and I think all of the, the members have been participating from somewhere within the Capitol complex. I was trying to pick out uh, which office building uh, each uh, member was in or committee room. And I, it looked like everyone was here on the Hill um, and ready to head over to vote shortly. So um, I'm really grateful for the information that all of you were able to share with us today. Um, I've taken uh, several notes for and we will certainly follow up with you to learn more information about some of the topics that were discussed today. So thank you again. Um, and Mr. Boss, I'd like to offer to you if you'd like to, to make any closing remarks. Um, Just once again, want to say thank thank you for every, to everyone for being here and uh, stay safe. Great. Well, thank you again, Mr. Boss. Um, and I want to thank everyone for being here today. And that concludes our virtual forum. Um, and everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you.